Bill, I have uh, reviewed your logbook and reviewed all of your uh, uh, application forms, and I've determined that, that you do meet all the requirements. So we're going to go ahead and begin with the test now. And I'd like to tell you that, of course, this is a practical test. And what that means is that, that every question I'm going to ask is of, a, is of a practical nature. You've already demonstrated your abilities academically on the written test. So if I ask a question, I want you to give me an answer from a practical point of view. It would be better to err on the conservative side rather than to err on the side that would cause you to break a rule uh, or put the, uh, the flight in jeopardy. And I've asked you to plan a cross country out uh, to the maximum range of the airplane, basically with your destination being Denver and your first stop along the way. Uh, what was the destination you chose this uh, to for this flight, for this leg of the flight? Well, uh, the first leg I've determined we could make it um, uh, to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So we've uh, done the first leg from Palwaukee to uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Okay. Very good. Uh, now, how did you determine to use uh, Cedar Rapids as your destination? Um, well, based on the, uh, the loading that you gave me here, uh, with the aircraft empty weight being uh, 1,927 pounds, uh, with the passenger loads that you gave me, uh, and the baggage that we're going to be taking along, uh, the maximum fuel that I could take and still stay underneath the, uh, the maximum gross weight of the aircraft was uh, 30 gallons, which is 180 pounds. Um, using uh, a conservative estimate of an hour uh, fuel reserve, uh, yeah, that's as far as I could go with BC Cedar Rapids, and it was a, a good choice. Okay. Uh, well, that sounds good. Now, Bill, I'd like to ask you, I'm uh, a little curious here, you've used an hour of reserve fuel. Uh, wh why did you use an hour of reserve? Well, uh, even though the, the rule is only 30 minutes for VFR uh, day, uh, I like to use an hour just because I've got a lot of people, you know, that they count on me to do things, so I'd like to stay around for them. Okay, so for safety. Right. Okay, so good. Good judgment. Good judgment there. Okay, very good. Now, uh, speaking of this flight then, I'd like to ask you, to show me the documentation that you would check in terms of maintenance records for now okay. regarding uh, this airplane. Okay. Well, uh, we'd find, track down the, uh, the engine log and the airframe log for this aircraft, which we've done here, and we're going to verify that all these inspections on this sheet have been accomplished. You know, um, what is this sheet here? This is just a, a sheet that I can use to uh, to walk through any particular flight with any particular aircraft, and you know, kind of guides me as to what I'm going to be looking for, both in the aircraft uh, and in the uh, the uh, maintenance records. Uh, so here I've documented when all these inspections were last done, and then uh, when they are due. Okay. Now, what's this inspection here on six? 1697. Uh, this inspection represents the last 100 hour uh, and annual inspection uh, done on this aircraft. Uh, if, if we're going to go out to the annual, uh, that would not be due until 630 of uh, 1998. Uh, if, however, we're in, in an operation that requires a 100 hour inspection, the, uh, the latest time that we could fly would be 6,383 hours on the tachometer. Uh, because the inspection was accomplished in 6,283 hours. Okay. Now, uh, what are some of these other uh, items you've listed here? Uh, let's see. Here we have the uh, the transponder test, uh, which was accomplished on 721 of 95, which is due then 731 of 97. It's a 24th calendar month test, uh, as is the pedostatic check. Uh, which was done on the same date, 721.95 to 731.97. Uh, and there is an altimeter uh, correction table in the logbook as well, indicating the altimeter had been tested. Uh, the ELT battery was last replaced on 728.95, uh, and it is due, uh, per the manufacturer's recommendation, on uh, 930.97, which is also noted in the airframe logbook. Okay, so we have the ELT uh, battery date there. Okay, how about any kind of uh, inspections of the ELT? Are there any requirement along those lines? Yes, there is. Uh, in addition to the to the battery replacement, there's also an ELT 12 month inspection required by Part 91. Okay, good. And did you check that? Be sure that was done. Uh, yes, I have. I have it bookmarked here. Okay. If you'd like to see it. Good. All right. 
Um, I don't see anything here about AD notes. First, what, what is an AD note? And have you reviewed any of those? Uh, well, an AD note is, uh, is it stands for Airworthiness Directive, uh, which is issued by the FAA when there's a uh, uh, faulty piece or you know something that they determine is a safety issue uh, that may require either one-time replacement or uh, recurring inspection. Um, and yes, there there is. Uh, a list of ADs in the airframe logbook for this airplane and I've gone over and verified that they've all been complied with. Um, there is one recurring AD uh, which is due every 100 hours for the seat rails and uh, that was last done at the 100 hour inspection that we noted before. Okay, and it's been uh, how many hours since then? It's been uh, about 60 hours since the last 100 hours. Okay, good. All right. Can you show me in the maintenance records uh, just some of these inspections? How about showing me the annual inspection? For sure. sure. Well, uh, if we're looking for the annual inspection, that's going to have to be done in the airframe log book as well as the engine log. So, there we go. We'll find the last last hundred hour and annual was uh, recorded here at uh, six sixteen of ninety seven. The uh, tack time, as we had on the sheet, six thousand two hundred eighty three hours. Uh, and then he notes the total time on the airframe. Uh, and then he gives a, a description of what he's accomplished, and here is the ELT check, ELT check per FAR 91207 paragraph D. Uh, here are some service bulletins that were complied with. Uh, here are some ADs that were also complied with. And CW is complied with AD 960906, and then he gives a description of the AD. And what we're really interested in is the magic words down here. Uh, I certify that this airframe has been inspected in accordance with an 100 hour annual inspection and was determined to be in airworthy condition. And then the mechanic has uh, signed it, put his certificate number, and then IA, which uh, makes Great. it. Yeah, Looks very good. And I see you've marked these with tabs. I like that. Makes it easy to find these. And these tabs represent all of the inspections you showed me on this uh, status sheet here? That's correct. I see you have an altimeter static system here. All right. Well, I'm satisfied. That, uh, that you have reviewed these, and uh, very nice job you did on that. Let's talk uh, a little bit about you as a pilot. If you were going to carry passengers on this flight, what would you have to have in your logbook in terms of recent flight experience? Uh, for passenger carrying operations, I must have done uh, three takeoffs and landings within the preceding uh, 90 days. Uh, and. Depending on how far out we're talking, I may have needed a biennial flight review by that time as well. Okay. Biennial flight review is required how often? Uh, once every 24 calendar months. Okay, good. All right. Now, I'd like to ask you, on this flight, we're going to be departing, and uh, it might be that we would be delayed and might arrive there after dark. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, additional recency or experience requirement? if you were going to land after dark? Uh, landing after dark, I must have, have made uh, three takeoffs and landings, uh, again, within the pr preceding 90 days, landing to a full stop. Okay, and those would have to be during it, what time of the day? Uh, between uh, sunset and sunrise. Okay, basically when it's dark. Right, right. Okay, actually, I think that's an uh, hour after. Yeah, that's right, sunset, exactly. Sure, hour exactly right. Sunrise. Yeah, they want it when it's, when it's good and dark. Correct. Okay, good, very good. All right. Um, now let's take a look at the um, weather. Have you reviewed the weather for the flight? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, anything specific? Uh, well, tell you what. How about this? Why don't you just show me for starters? Uh, how about showing me the forecast for your destination airport? Okay. Okay. Here we have the uh, terminal area forecast for uh, Cedar Rapids. Okay. This is simply the airport identifier. Uh, this is the date and the time of issue. So this was issued on the 1st at 1130 Zulu. Uh, this is a valid time here. The 1st from uh, 1200 Zulu until 1200 Zulu the following day. They're forecasting between 1200 and 1400 Zulu. Uh, winds variable at six knots, visibility of four statue miles due to mist, and uh, broken layer at two zero thousand feet. Uh, from uh, fourteen hundred Zulu, winds are forecast to be one six zero at twelve knots, 
uh, visibility better than six miles, uh, and again, the broken layer at two zero thousand feet. That's good enough. Let's move down to the winds aloft. Can you tell me what the winds aloft would be along your route? Sure. Um, here they have uh, generally all the winds aloft for the various reporting stations along the route uh, with uh, different altitudes listed. For example, here at, uh, at 3,000 feet over Joliet, uh, the winds are forecast to be 340 at 13 uh, knots. At 6,000 feet over Joliet, 330 at uh, 17 knots with a temperature of positive 15 degrees centigrade. That's good enough. You seem to know how to do that fine. All righty, um, let's, uh, let's move over to looking at, uh, I see these things there, they say NOTAMs. What are those? Uh, those are notices to airmen, uh, and these would be reflective of, uh, you know, things that might be out or broken uh, uh, or restricted uh, along, our, along our route of flight. And here we can see we've got uh, a few NOTAMs here for Powaukee our departure airport. Uh, we see Powaukee uh, runway 16, the last 641 feet is closed between uh, 1400 and uh, uh, 2000 weekdays. Uh, and then this gives us the, the time that it's effective giving the uh, year. Uh, That's good enough. We're going to get at all that. Excellent. Very good. I'd like to uh, move on to some weather charts. Okay. Uh, just to discuss these with you very briefly, we don't need to get into details. These are just some samples that I've provided here. <coughs> just want to see that you've received some training on these. Okay. I have a chart here that is a, oh, a weather, de oh, well, I see a weather depiction as it says, and this is a radar summary chart. Can you tell me what is the difference between these two? Well, uh, the difference is, is that this shows uh, areas of IFR uh, noted by the shaded region. Uh, areas of marginal VFR noted by the contoured region. Uh, it gives individual reporting stations with cloud cover uh, and heights and in some cases visibilities and maybe obstructions to visibilities uh, and also frontal positions. Okay, now you say IFR. What is IFR? Well, IFR would be uh, less than uh, 1,000 foot ceiling and, and or less than uh, 3 miles visibility. And if you didn't know, you could look right down here. Okay, great. All right, let's talk about this other one, the radar summary. What does that show us? Uh, this, on the other hand, does not show areas of IFR. It, in fact, shows areas of precipitation, uh, precipitation only, uh, so that as we move in on each contour level here, uh, we see more and more intense precipitation. So this would be a very intense line of precipitation right here. Okay. also gives direction and velocity. Now can you tell me which one of these, if either, is a forecast of what the weather will be? Uh, actually, both of these are, are history. So neither one is a forecast. That's correct. Okay, good. Let's take a look over at another chart. This one is called the, as you can see on the top, this is a uh, weather prog chart. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, um, what do you know about, uh, can you tell me a little bit about this chart? In particular, I'd like to know uh, what these times mean here mm -hmm. and uh, what the difference is between this chart and, and, uh, and the one below it. They both seem to be for the same valid time. Okay. Well, uh, basically the times are just that. These are the valid times. Uh, so these two panels, for example, are, are valid at the same time. They were issued uh, 12 hours prior. Uh, so this would indicate that these two panels were issued uh, probably at zero 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 Zulu, and uh, these panels over here are valid at uh, 2400 Zulu or midnight Zulu. So these would be more accurate forecasts than these, at least from the valid time. You mean because of the fact that this is further in the future than that one? Correct. Okay, yeah. good. Um, now the difference between the top and the bottom panel uh, this indicates surface weather, in other words, precipitation, positions of uh, uh, fronts, lows, and highs at the surface, whereas this indicates uh, weather, different types of weather from the surface up to uh, 24,000 feet. Okay, how do you, how do you know it's 24,000 feet? Well, it says uh, surface to uh, to 400 millibars here, and I looked this up in the uh, in the Aviation Weather Services book, and they said that, that was approximately 24,000. Sure, 400 millibars, 24,000, sure. Okay, uh, excellent. You seem uh, uh, well prepared on that. I'd like to uh, just ask you, I didn't see that there were any uh, segments or airments. Uh, what is a segment or an airment? Can you tell me? Uh, well, an airment uh, 
gives us different meteorological conditions that generally speaking affect lighter aircraft, uh, things like widespread IFR, areas of uh, turbulence and uh, icing, and uh, reports of the freezing level, or forecast of the freezing level. Um, Sigments are, uh, are significant meteorological conditions, uh, which would be like um, uh, stronger turbulence, uh, severe icing, things like that. Uh, and then we also have convective segments, which deal with uh, convective type activity, which would include uh, you know, tornadoes, hail, uh, and thunderstorms. Okay, good. While we're on the subject of meteorology, I want to ask you something about uh, wind shear reports. And normally we get wind shear reports from the tower for landing. Mm -hmm. And if you were landing and the tower told you that there was a wind shear report, an aircraft ahead had reported a 10 knot loss of airspeed on final, mm -hmm. what, what action uh, would you take uh, because of this wind shear report? Well, I would, uh, I would definitely use a higher approach speed, a higher indicated approach speed uh, to compensate for that loss of speed potentially happening to me. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, very good. Let's, uh, well, let me ask one more thing. What if uh, there was a thunderstorm over the field and they were coming in and a, an aircraft ahead reported a 30 knot loss in airspeed? Uh, would this have any uh, effect on, what would you, how would you, uh, what would you do in that case? I'd uh, either stay away, uh, wait for the thunderstorm to pass and give it at least 20 minutes after it's passed, uh, or I'd divert to a different airport. Sure, that sounds like a good idea. Good judgment. All right, I'd like to talk to you about the uh, pilot operate handbook. Now this is for a 182 Cessna you're taking your check ride in mm -hmm. for private pilot. And let's uh, talk a little bit about the use of the uh, charts. So uh, let's start out with uh, talking about oh, some some uh, computations you'd have to make, like how, how would you do a takeoff distance problem? Okay. Well, I'd uh, flip to the performance section and usually take off takeoff distances are towards the beginning here. Um, <clears throat> since we're almost at maximum gross weight, we're just a few pounds underneath maximum gross weight, I would use this chart here, indicating 2,950 pounds, and very carefully read the conditions uh, and any notes the manufacturers included with the chart, uh, and then I'd uh, jump right in. Um, go over here to our weight of 2,950 pounds, uh, they give us a liftoff speed and then a speed to, to use until 50 feet. Um, I would I would err on the conservative side and use a higher pressure altitude than, than I really would yeah, expect. What, you talk about pressure altitude. What is pressure altitude? Uh, pressure altitude would be the altitude of the aircraft if it were a standard day. Okay. Uh, how could we get pressure altitude if we were sitting in the airplane and wanted to get it easily? Uh, we could simply adjust 2992 in the Coltsman window. Okay. And then we'd read it from the altimeter. Perfect. All right. So go ahead with that. So you're going to use 1,000 feet to err on the conservative side. The elevation here is 640. 650. Or so. 650, yeah, okay. So uh, using 1,000 feet, that sounds good. So 1,000 feet, and we, we have about uh, positive 27 degrees centigrade, so I would use. 30. Sounds good. Again, using a, a warmer temperature, which would be reduced performance, so again, more conservative. Uh, and here we see a ground roll of 850 feet and uh, 1,635 feet to clear the 50 foot obstacle. And I take 50% of these numbers and add them to them uh, to build in uh, an extra safety margin. Extra safety margin. Okay, good. All right, that sounds great. Well, that's the first computation you want to do. And I, I see in your notes you actually made this computation for our takeoff today. Correct. Good. Now, the next computation you probably want to make is, is a consideration of cruise performance. Mm -hmm. What altitude did you select for the flight we were going to conduct? Well, uh, I selected 8,500 feet. Okay. Uh, so we can go to the cruise performance for 8, and I also have a cruise performance table for, uh, for 10,000 as okay. well. Let's just use 8, Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, it, so we don't have to uh, interpolate anything. Sure. And we'll use this. It's actually a little bit warmer than standard, but we'll just use standard for purposes of this. Okay. Um, I normally run at about 2,300 RPM for uh, noise levels. Uh, normally about 70% power as well, so we'll elect to use 71%. We'll come back and see that we're going to need a manifold pressure of about 21 inches. Uh, at that manifold pressure and RPM combination, I'd expect 140 knots uh, true airspeed and a fuel burn of 12.1 uh, gallons per hour per the book. Again, I build in a conservative factor of called 13 or 13 and a half gallons. 
Okay, sounds good. Now I want to ask you, you say that the plane will have a true airspeed of 140. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, if you were at 8,000 feet and the airplane was going to true airspeed of 140, mm -hmm. what do you anticipate that your indicated airspeed would be in order for all your time distance computations to be correct? In other words, how would you know if you're really going 140? Well, uh, in order to do that, I'd, uh, I'd have to figure out what I would expect to indicate. Um, so we'll come back over here. Per our chart, we saw that it was minus one degree centigrade at, uh, at 8,000 feet. So using my A6B, I'd come to, uh, to 8,000 feet. And I'll put minus one degree. It's hard to be real precise with this, but that's close enough. I would guess. Okay. <laughs> so we've got minus one over 8,000 feet. Uh, we have a true airspeed of 140. So we've come to the outer scale. Just using these directions here, come to the outer scale of uh, 140 knots true. And reading the inner scale, we'd see about 125 calibrated. Okay, calibrated of 125. Well, how about indicated? What would that be? Well, I would then take the calibrated airspeed, return to the performance charts uh, towards the front. Probably there's a, an airspeed correction table to go from calibrated to indicated. Okay, and a cruise it's probably uh, probably one or two knots, one, maybe. If, if that. Okay. Right. Let's just say that the calibrated and indicated are the same. So that would give you an indicated speed of 125. Right. Okay. Now my question to you is this: Suppose on this flight. When you say your true airspeed is 140, mm -hmm. you say your airspeed indicator is only going to indicate 125, though. Mm -hmm. But suppose on this flight you check your ground speed, mm -hmm. and your ground speed is 135. Mm -hmm. Remember, your airspeed only shows 125, right. but your ground speed is 135. Do you have a headwind or a tailwind? In that case, I would have a, a five-knot headwind component, uh, because I would want to compare my true airspeed to my ground speed to determine the wind. Excellent. I get a lot of people come to this test are very confused about this, and they think the indicated speed is, is the factor, but it's really the true airspeed is the most important. Excellent. You seem well prepared on that. Let's move over now to a landing distance problem. Okay. And you're going to uh, do a landing. Uh, uh, can you show me just how you do a landing distance problem? Sure. Well, essentially the same way as I would, I would determine the, uh, the takeoff distance, Come to the landing distance chart and note that it's a short field here. So I would again read any conditions and notes that uh, that exist for this chart. Um, uh, look at the maximum gross weight. Those would give us uh, again a most conservative estimate. Uh, they give us a recommended approach speed at 60 uh, of 60 at 50 feet. Again, I'd uh, err on the conservative side of a thousand foot pressure altitude. I believe uh, Cedar Rapids is about 800. And uh, go to the warmer temperature, so for a thousand feet at the warmer temperature of 30 degrees centigrade, see a ground run of uh, 645 feet and a total to clear 50 feet of 1,440 feet. Okay. Uh, and again, I, I add 50% of those numbers. Okay. Uh, just for conservative. Right. I see. Good. Right. Okay. Now, I notice that it shows the indicated approach speed to be 60 knots <coughs> at sea level. What if you were landing at an airport that was shown here as, say, 7,000 feet? Mm -hmm. Would you use the same speed, a higher speed, or a lower speed at high elevation? Well, since they don't make any differentiation, and, and I know this, I know better than that anyway, I would use uh, the same indicated approach speed no matter what my elevation is. Always follow the same indicated. However, I'd have a much higher true air speed at that altitude, so I'd be eating up more ground. So that's why you'd use more runway at higher altitude, right? Because your true airspeed's higher. That's right. Yeah. Okay, that's a perfect answer. Good. Now I'd like to talk to you, uh, referring to our takeoff. A little earlier, we were looking at the takeoff chart, and it showed these distances, mm -hmm. and it also showed performance for a higher elevation. Right? If you were taking off from a higher elevation, what would you do different as far as the engine controls and the and the, and the flight controls and whatever? Uh, what would you do different, possibly? From uh, at, at a higher elevation than a lower elevation. Well, I would uh, I would lean uh, lean the engine because I'm going to be excessively rich if sure. I don't do that. And Excellent. You want to lean the engine up? Okay, good. All right. I'd like to ask you just a little general consideration of the use of flaps. If you were taking off at a high elevation, mm -hmm. is there anything you've been taught about performance and the use of flaps when you're uh, taking off from high elevation, high density altitude airports? Uh, well, uh, you'd want to take off with the minimum flap uh, recommended by the manufacturer for any takeoff uh, because 
if you use flap at the higher uh, higher density altitudes, you're going to have much much decreased uh, climb performance. Okay, good. So excellent. So uh, what if a runway was a problem? What if you're taking off from say uh, an airport around here and it was a fairly short runway, right? Mm -hmm. it, and you had no obstructions. Uh, what about flaps? Would they help you there? They would. Uh, if you use flap in that situation, it would probably uh, decrease your ground run. Okay. So it would be an advantage. That's then. correct. Yeah. And just to be sure I understand you, if we were at an elevation of say <clears throat> six or seven thousand feet and we had a runway that was ten thousand feet long, mm -hmm. uh, but performance was in question, you were at maximum weight and, and it appeared you could make it, but would you think that flaps would, would help you uh, in that case or would they hurt you? Uh, they would hurt me. Okay, sure. That, that decreased performance. Right. Excellent. Very good. While we're on the subject of performance, I'd like to ask you, suppose you were taking off from a high elevation airport like Cheyenne and, uh, and you saw the sign that said check density altitude mm -hmm. and the temperature outside was 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? Okay. Can you tell me what do they mean and how would you determine density altitude? Well, uh, density altitude uh, is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperatures. Okay. Uh, so that, that definitely is an indicator of how well the aircraft is going to perform. The higher the density altitude, the, uh, the worse the performance, and I determined density altitude using these. Why don't you show me what the density altitude would be for uh, for Cheyenne, which is uh, 6,100 feet, on a, on a day when it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which happens to be, I think, uh, what does that show in centigrade there? 90 degrees Fahrenheit is about 32 centigrade. Okay, so we're going to be at 6,100 feet. We'll say the altimeter setting is 2992, so, uh, so we can use uh, uh, Field elevation, the same as pressure altitude. Okay. And uh, just tell me what the density altitude would be. Okay. Well, uh, if our pressure altitude is field elevation, then, excuse me, 6,100 feet and 32 degrees centigrade over 6,100 would give us a density altitude of just under uh, 10,000 feet. Okay. Good. You seem to know uh, know how to do that. That's fine. What does that mean, really, when we say we have a density altitude of over 10,000 feet? What does that indicate to you in terms of performance? That indicates uh, the aircraft is performing as if it were at uh, 10,000 feet. So I would expect very poor uh, climb performance. Uh, I would expect a much, much longer takeoff run mm -hmm. um, and a low climb angle. Sure, okay, good. You say it would be performing as though it's at 10,000 feet, mm -hmm. under 10,000 feet on what conditions? On, on, a, uh, on a standard day. A standard day, sure. Okay. You seem very well prepared on a performance. Uh, you showed me your weight and balance just a minute ago. Let me take a look at this here. We were looking at this earlier. You showed me the weight and balance. Uh, now I can see you've determined it's within weight. How do you know it's within balance? Uh, well, I can determine whether or not it's in, within balance. They, they have two different charts here for, for uh, this aircraft. Uh, we can compare the weight and uh, the center of gravity, or we can compare the weight and the uh, moment divided by a thousand. Okay, and how do you, do you have a chart for this, yes. or what do you do? Yeah, we've got a uh, chart here on the uh, weight balance section of the, there we go. There are the two charts. This one again is, uh, is the moment uh, in the weight chart. So we can look over here, and we noted uh, that we have 125.72 and, and uh, 29.41. So 125.72 would be you know approximately along this line, and 29.41 would be just underneath there. So we'd end up approximately there in this envelope picture. Okay. That's good. I'd like to ask you, how far above the maximum weight can you be? None. None. Okay. So that's a perfect answer. Good. All right. Uh, how far aft of this line, how far over there could you be? None. None, okay. If you were to actually not do a weight and balance, and you actually were flying, so you didn't know, unknown to you, you took off and the center gravity uh, uh, dot was located right here, the, the center gravity uh, compared to gross weight was over here, what flight characteristics would the airplane have? Well, over here I would expect, uh, uh, with an aft CG, I would expect a, a lower stalling speed. I'd expect very unstable aircraft, uh, harder to control. Um, let's see, I would uh, better better cruise performance, maybe higher true airspeed. Okay. Um, so basically, sort of unstable, you said. Right. 
poor stall recovery poor stall. characteristics. Okay, good. All right. And what if it was a f too far forward? What would you notice? Too far forward would have a higher stalling speed, which would be a, a bad thing. Um, might be difficult to rotate. Uh, be very stable. Uh, it would have good stall recovery uh, characteristics. Okay. Um, and decrease cruise performance. Decrease. Okay. How about at landing? If you were making a short field landing, for instance, would you maybe find any problems in that case? Uh, um, um, not say flaring out or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, it'd be difficulty uh, difficulty flaring. It'd be tough to uh, to reach that, that good flare attitude. Part of a lot of back pressure. A lot of back if pressure. we had enough. If you had enough. Okay, good. That's a good. I like to hear that. If you had enough, you might not even have enough, right? Right. Perfect. Very good answer. Okay. Uh, one more thing I'd like to ask you. When you do this weight and balance, you use an empty weight of 1927. Where did you get that weight? Uh, well, I got this actually from the weight and balance of this aircraft done by a mechanic uh, a few months ago when they added a piece of equipment. Okay, uh, excellent. So, you mean this empty weight changes from time to time? Yeah, uh, anytime anything is added or removed from the aircraft, these numbers uh, have to be recalculated. Okay, so the empty weight includes equipment on board the airplane. Is there anything else that it includes? Uh, it includes unusable fuel, uh, oil. Okay, good. Seem to understand that very well. I'd like to uh, move on now. I'd like to talk to you about the systems on the airplane. Okay. Now I have a cockpit picture here from a 172. Mm -hmm. I realize your airplane's a 182, but uh, we'll just use this for general reference. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to talk to you about the pitot-static system, and I'd like to ask you if the static vent were clogged up, if you had water in the uh, in the uh, in the static line, which of these instruments would be affected by that? But the static line, uh, we would have the airspeed indicator uh, right here. We'd have the altimeter and the vertical speed all affected. All affected, okay. That's, that's exactly right. <clears throat> what if the pitot tube itself, only the pitot tube, were clogged by an insect, for example? What would that affect? No, that would only affect the, uh, the airspeed indicator. Okay, exactly right. Now, I'd like to ask you, uh, are you familiar with the stall, uh, with the stall warning on the airplane? Yeah. Okay. And it has a little, um, uh, just a little uh, uh, reed. reed out there in the in the, uh, in the wing. I'd like to ask you, does that work when the airspeed indicator gets right down to stall? Is that what makes that reed sound? No. No. What what makes that reed sound? Angle of attack. Angle of attack. flowing over that reed. Okay. Does it have anything at all to do with the airspeed indicator? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Exactly right. Good. Now, referring to the airspeed indicator, I notice that there's some color marks on there. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about those color marks, in particular, the white mark? What does that mean? Sure. This, uh, this white arc right in here indicates a uh, normal flap operating range. Okay. So what would be the lower limit of the white arc? What would lower, that be associated with? The lower limit of the white arc would be associated with the uh, power off stalling speed uh, in the landing configuration in this case. Okay, and what would the upper limit of the white arc indicate? Upper limit of the white arc would be the uh, highest recommended airspeed to deploy flap as recommended. Okay, good. Uh, how about the green arc? What does that indicate? Green arc represents normal operating range. Bottom of the green arc indicates uh, power off stalling speed with the flaps up or in a specified configuration. Okay. Uh, and the top of the green arc indicates uh, VNO or normal operating. Okay. How about the red line? What does that indicate? Red line over here indicates VNE, which is never exceed speed, or the max window opens. All right. And what about the yellow arc? What does that indicate? The yellow arc indicates uh, caution range uh, to be used in smooth air only. Okay. Good. I notice on this particular airspeed indicator, it has some some numbers, uh, some looks like temperatures and, and pressure altitudes there. When would you ever use that? Well, again, uh, in flight, if you wanted to check your true airspeed, uh, you could you could make the adjustment here, just as we did on the E6B earlier. We'd put uh, our outside air temperature and just read it off of the OAT. Uh, we put that over our pressure altitude, um, and we could determine pressure altitude again by just twisting 2992 there. You'd have to write that one down first, so <laughs> we won't Good. forget what it was. Uh, then we could read what our true airspeed was on this outer black scale here. You can see 100, 110, 120. I see. Good. Okay, this is an extra feature they have on this airplane. Right. Good. Excellent. All right, I'd like to ask you this. Over here, I see a, an instrument that says on its suction, right? Mm -hmm. And on your 182, you have one of these also. Right. Uh, what does that indicate to you in particular if you're doing your run up and you saw that it was abnormally low? 
right? What what does that indicate in potential problems, or what effect will that have possibly? Well, I would expect that uh, my attitude indicator and my directional gyro uh, may be inaccurate. It may be okay, but I wouldn't I wouldn't anticipate they'd be okay. Okay. Expect Where does this suction come from that that, uh, that has to do with these gyros? Well, this is uh, measuring the suction generated by an engine-driven vacuum pump. Okay. Very good. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about this instrument here. What kind of an instrument is this, and how does it operate? This is the uh, the turn coordinator. Uh, this indicates the rate of turn, uh, rate of roll, uh, and this is called the inclinometer, and this indicates the quality of the turn. Uh, so it would indicate if we are skidding or, or slipping. Right. And it's got uh, DC electric power to it. When the power is is not reaching the unit, you'd see a little red flying here. Sounds good. Very good answers. Can you tell me here we have some fuel gauges and we have an oil temperature and oil pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, how are these powered? Uh, these are electric gauges. Which gauges? Uh, all of them uh, need electricity to operate. Uh, this also records the temperature, records the temperature here, uh, and these are electric. Okay. All right. If, the, if, if we say, for instance, had an electrical system failure, you say these would fail. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how about these here? Would they, would they operate or would they fail? Um, I believe that they would actually operate still. Sure, that's right. Exactly. Right. I was incorrect. Yeah, while well, right. you were correct, this is an electric one, the, the temperature, but it's a it's a self-generating electric system. You're correct; they would operate in the and the oil pressure, which you can't see because it's hidden here, that uh, is uh, it's not electric, just but it's pressure. just a pressure sure. instrument. Sure, exactly right. Good. Now, suppose we were flying along while we're talking about the electrical system. All right. Mm -hmm. Suppose you're flying along in cruise and a little red light came on. You can't see it here, it's hidden by the wheel, but it says something like low voltage, mm -hmm. right? That light comes on. And also, you see that the amp meter here is showing a discharge. Mm -hmm. What action would you take, and what does this indicate? Well, uh, since I've never actually had it happen, I rehearsed it, but I've never had it happen, I would still consult the, the pilot's operating handbook or the, the emergency checklist, look for the procedure for having a low voltage light eliminated, um, and what it indicates is that most likely I have had uh, some kind of failure with the alternator. Okay. Is there any way you might be able to fix this in flight? Potentially. Uh, we could uh, shut off the alternator portion of the master switch uh, back on again and see if we could uh, bring it back online. Okay, good. Suppose that that doesn't work, the light is still on, mm -hmm. and the amp meter is still showing a discharge. What kind of problems are you? What kind of situation are we in right now? Well, we're uh, we're running on battery power now, uh, or at least the electrical components are running on battery power. Okay. Uh, so I would expect them to fail within 15 minutes if I'm lucky. Okay, 15 minutes or so. All right. Now, tell me this. Suppose that that uh, you were to uh, uh, to fly, and suppose that the battery did uh, did fail. First of all, is there anything you can do to extend that battery life to maybe go beyond 15 minutes? Uh, sure, I could I could begin to, to shut down unnecessary electrical equipment. Um, you know, I would turn off any lights that, that really weren't required. Uh, you know, obviously if it's at night, I'm going to have to have uh, certain lights still on. Uh, during the daytime, I would probably like to turn all of them off. Um, and I'd, I'd probably turn off the number two radio, only monitor on the number one. Uh, this transmission takes up a lot of power. Uh, I'd, I'd leave this on. So I don't scare anybody. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right. Maybe about it. All right. And uh, suppose though that you couldn't land before this time, and the battery did go dead. All right. Mm -hmm. What kind of problems would we have then? Uh, if the battery did go dead. Yes. Well, I I, I couldn't transmit or, or receive anything. Okay. Uh, Could you navigate with your radios? No. no. Uh, I couldn't navigate using using those. Okay. And um, would your uh, position lights stay on or anything? And no. No, they, they would go dead. So that would be very bad. Right. right. How about uh, extending the flaps? Would we be able to extend the flaps? Wouldn't be able to extend the flaps. Yeah. Why, why is that? Because these are electrically uh, driven flaps, an electric okay. motor. Sure. Okay. That's exactly correct. So it's a good idea to get on the ground. Uh, how about the engine? Would the engine continue to run? Just fine. Just fine. Well, where would it yeah. get its electrical power? It uh, gets its electrical uh, current from magnetos. Okay. Good. All right, let's move over here and talk some more about the pedostatic instruments, in particular about the altimeter. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I'd like to uh, ask you this. Suppose that, 
that uh, we're here at Powaki where the elevation is about 640 feet, mm -hmm. and suppose that you went out to the airplane to go flying on this test, and the altimeter read just like it does here. It read 1,400 feet. What would cause that altimeter to reach 1,400 feet just overnight without our touching it, just getting in the plane the next morning? What would cause that to happen? Low pressure system uh, moved into the area, so the aircraft thought that it climbed. Okay. At least the altimeter thought sure. that it climbed. Exactly. So what would you do to correct this problem? Listen up to the ATIS, get the correct altimeter <laughs> setting, and sure. just right in there. Pretty simple. Good. Okay. Now, when we're flying cross country, we're going to Cedar Rapids, right? If, for instance, they give us an altimeter setting that is lower than we have set in here, mm -hmm. suppose you have 30 inches set and they give you an altimeter setting of 2980, for example, mm -hmm. and if you fail to set that in, the, in there, uh, what kind of problems would you have? Well, uh, I would be lower than I thought I was, high to low, I'll look out below. Okay, and if you do set the current altimeter setting in there, then when you land, what would your altimeter read in general? If I had then the correct altimeter? Mm -hmm. Uh, in general, show field elevation. Okay, that's exactly correct. Now I'd like to talk to you about this. I've heard that there are errors in the altimeter associated with temperature. All right? Can you tell me <coughs> a little bit about how you ever correct for that, if ever? Uh, well, uh, essentially it's hot to cold, uh, look out below. So when I'm, I'm flying in colder than standard uh, temperatures, less than 59 at the surface, um, I would, I would want to pay particular attention to any terrain or obstacles that I might be flying over. Um, and the, the error tends to disappear the closer I get to the ground because it's a, a percentage the type error. Error, okay. Right, yeah. right. Okay, yeah, the error tends to get less as you get closer to the ground. Okay, right. well, tell me this then. If you were going into Cedar Rapids and it was very cold, mm -hmm. it was, uh, you know, below zero there, and you were going in to land there, when you land at Cedar Rapids, what would your altimeter read if you set the current altimeter set? Field elevation. Field elevation. So it, the cold air doesn't affect you as far as landing at, a, at an airport then? No. And when does it affect you? It affects you at uh, high absolute altitudes or, okay. or, or very far away from the ground. Okay. Farther so, away, or the bigger the air okay. potential. So if there was an antenna along the route and you right. thought you were going to clear it by a few hundred feet, if it was cold air, well, how would this affect it? Uh, if it were cold air, then I'd... Uh, and I thought I was just going to be 100 feet over it, right. I'd probably smack right into okay. the top of That's it. That's exactly correct. Good. Okay, you seem to understand that altimetry. Excellent job. Very good. Okay, um, I'd like to talk to you about these radios here, right? And I'd like to ask you, uh, we have two VHF uh, uh, navcoms here, and we have an ADF radio over here, right? Are any of these radios associated with the term line of sight, and are any of them not associated with it? The, uh, the VOR radios are, are associated with line of sight reception or VHF frequencies. Um, okay. And then How about the ADF? That one is not line of sight. Okay. No. All right. Good. Now I'd like to talk to you about the VHF radio. I'd like to ask you if there's any special frequency that you know of that you can use whenever you're in an emergency that uh, can be used. 121.5 one uh, okay. would be the emergency frequency. And if you had to use that frequency, who would you probably be able to contact? Whoever happens to be listening. Okay. <laughs> you know, probably Is there anybody that monitors this routine? Uh, sure, flight service. Flight service, okay. Okay, good. How about towers? Towers monitor. Towers, sir. Okay, good. All right. Now, um, we have a device here. It's called a transponder. Are there any special codes you know of that you've memorized for use in a transponder? Mm -hmm. 1200. Okay. Uh, it's VFR uh, code. Typical. Uh, for emergencies, we'd have 7,700 for general emergency, 7,600 for uh, communications emergency, communications failure sure. specifically, uh, and then uh, 7,500 uh, when that guy wants me to take him to Cuba. Okay, for hijack. You know, okay. hijack. Okay, good. Suppose you called, uh, you were going over Cedar Rapids and you called approach control and they said squat code 0215 mm -hmm. and you dialed that in there. Should you push this button that says ID on it then? Only if they request them. Only if they request it. Sure, exactly right. Very good answer. Okay. Suppose that you were coming in there and you were at, uh, say, for instance, uh, 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 you're at 8,500 feet and you call approach control and they tell you to squawk altitude, mm -hmm. right? What does that mean? Squawk altitude means to verify that we've uh, got the altitude mode selected here. In other words, we're kind of in the mode C mode. Okay. It doesn't mean that you should put 8,500 in here or anything. Does That's it? right. Okay, no. good. I'm glad you know that. There was a person that that did that one time, and he was at 7,500 feet when he did that, and he put in 7,500, and they thought he was being hijacked, you see, so, so that's why I wanted to ask you that, to be sure you know that. Very good, thank you. Okay, 
Um, when do we turn the transponder to on? Uh, to on? Taking the runway uh, for departure. Okay, when do we turn it uh, off for the standby? Uh, after doing the after landing checklist. Okay, excellent, very good. All right, I'd like to uh, move down here to the, uh, uh, oh, to the mixture control. Right? Okay. Now, of course, in your airplane, you have a constant speed propeller. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you, how do you lean out your airplane for cruise flight? Well, after I've uh, got the appropriate cruise settings in, I'm giving it you know, a minute or two for the temperatures to kind of stabilize. Uh, then I'd, I'd begin to lean here, and I'd use my exhaust gas temperature or EGT okay. gauge. Sure. Um, and I, I'd look for the, the peak. In other words, as I start to, to lean the mixture, uh, do it very slowly, you know, slowly twisting it back, watching for this temperature indicator to rise. Uh, eventually, it'll hit a point where it peaks, it'll peak, mm -hmm. and then it'll start to come back down again if I continue to lean, which would be bad mm -hmm. if I kept doing that. It would quit eventually. Sure. Uh, so I would, after I saw it peak, I'd know where it peaked. So, for example, if it peaked right here, I'd enrich in it, uh, enrich in it, enrich in it, enrich in it until it eventually peaked again and then it would start to cool back down on the, on the rich side of peak. Okay. Uh, and I would enrich into, you know, uh, they actually say in the pilot's operating handbook uh, that for 65% power and so on, you can lean to peak EGT for best economy. Mm -hmm. uh, my mechanic recommended to me that I lean, or correction, yeah, I, I lean to, uh, to 25 to 50 degrees rich of peak. Okay, good. Now what if you leaned it too lean? What kind of problems would you have? Uh, if I leaned it too lean, uh, well, uh, potential damage to the, to the cylinders and not getting enough fuel for cooling, uh, proper cooling, um, you know, might have a rough running engine, uh, okay. depending on. Okay. How about cylinder. the temperature of the engine? Would that be affected? Uh, temperature would probably be, be high. Okay. Good. Cylinder head. Good. I want to ask you now, uh, when an engine gets hot, I want to ask you, um, if the engine gets too hot, what kind of problems can this lead to on the engine? Uh, with the engine getting too hot, we can have, uh, you know, uh, cracked cylinders. Uh, if we get rapid temperature changes, either heating or cooling, we can get cracked cylinders. Uh, we can get, uh, you know, valves that uh, they start to crack. Okay, so it's bad for the engine. Real bad. Yes, okay. I want to ask you, have you ever heard of the term detonation? Detonation. What, what is detonation? Uh, detonation is uh, uh, basically an ignition of the engine uh, when it's not supposed to be igniting uh, due to high temperature. All right, so this could cause detonation too. Right. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Perfect. Now, what if you were too rich? Suppose you richened it up too much, or you never leaned it out at all. What kind of problems would you have? Uh, in that case, I'd have higher fuel burn. Uh, I'd have a real cool engine. In some cases, for higher performance engines, that's okay. not good to run it too cool either. Okay. Um, I can't think of anything. So rough, rough running it. engine? Yeah, potentially at yeah. higher altitudes. Sure, yeah. okay, sure, okay. All right, good. How about the spark plugs? Is there anything that can cause the spark plugs to become fouled, for example? Sure, an excessively rich Excess mixture. Okay, that's another thing. Good, okay, good, excellent. Um, let's go over now and let's talk a little bit about, well, as long as we we're talking about the, the power settings, you were saying you were going to set the power setting at normal cruise, something like 21, 23, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is this. If we were cruising along at 21, 23, with this constant speed propeller, if we were to get carburetor ice, because this is a carbureted engine, how would you, what, what, what indication would you have in this airplane of carburetor ice? Uh, in this airplane, I'd see a reduction in, in manifold pressure because, uh, you know, we're, we're blocking off the throat. Okay, so you draw a drop in manifold pressure. Right. Now, in a 172, or an airplane with a fixed pitch propeller, you get a drop in RPM. Why wouldn't the RPM drop in this airplane? Uh, well, we've got a, a prop governor on this airplane, which will uh, basically change the, the pitch of the blade to a, a flatter pitch to maintain the higher RPM. You might see a little okay. bit of loss in uh, true airspeed. Okay, good. Right. Now, if, if you if you kept bringing the throttle back, or say you get just like you're getting more and more ice, all right, mm -hmm. and if, uh, is there a point where the RPM might finally drop off, or does it stay the same always? No, it'll it'll eventually drop off once we've reached the flat pitch stop. In other words, it. The propeller can only twist so far. Once it hits that the limits, that's that's it. That's okay. the best it can do. That's exactly correct. Good. Now, just to see if you truly understand the manifold pressure and RPM, 
again, we're back at cruise at 21, 23, for example, and suppose the engine died from fuel starvation, right? mm -hmm. what would you expect the manifold pressure to do? Mm, basically, you stay about the same. About the same, sure, exactly right, good. I've determined you completely understand the constant speed propeller. Good, I'm glad to see that, because I get some people come to me that just have no idea how that operates. Excellent, very good job. Now, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about priming the engine. Okay. Right? This is a carbureted engine, we go to start it, we want to prime the engine, right? Uh -huh. Now we have a, a primer here, right? And uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, we prime it probably a few strokes for starting. What is the danger of over-priming it? Carburetor fire. Carburetor fire, okay, mm -hmm. certainly, exactly right. Now, suppose that, that you were priming it, you may have primed it too much and it wasn't starting, and you had someone standing by outside with a fire extinguisher in case it caught fire, but uh, but it, it just wasn't starting, and it wasn't catching fire either, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so the engine is, uh, you, you want to use a technique for starting when the engine is flooded, right? Sure. And I want to ask you what technique you know about for starting a flooded engine. Well, again, I, I go to the, the pilot's operating hand because I'm a very familiar plant airplane. Uh, but in this case, uh, I would uh, pull the mixture all the way back, okay. throttle full forward, so we're giving it no fuel and gobs of air uh, okay. to hope that we find the, the magic mixture. Okay. to light it off. Uh, we try starting again. If it eventually did start, we'd uh, enrich in the mixture rapidly but not cramming it in, and then we'd smoothly pull the throttle back to normal at okay. RPM. Good. Excellent. All right. That's a perfect answer. Now, I'd like to ask you, suppose that, that uh, while we normally prime the engine with the primer, mm -hmm. occasionally I see people that prime the engine with the throttle. Mm -hmm. Not that that's necessarily recommended, but I see people doing that, right? Mm -hmm. What in effect are you doing whenever you pump that throttle in the so-called primer? Dumping raw fuel into the, uh, the carburetor. Okay, lots now, of it. What, why is that? Uh, well, basically, uh, the fuel is being metered, you know, uh, to some extent by the throttle position. So as we start to come up with that throttle, uh, not only are we introducing a lot more air into the carburetor, but we're also just dumping a lot of raw fuel. So that if you were going to be doing this, you certainly wouldn't want to do it without having the engine turning. Okay. You want that to be okay. You know, so when you pump it, you pump raw fuel in there. Right? I think that's called the. Uh, you know what that device is called that pumps that fuel in there like that? Accelerator. Pump. Accelerator pump. Sure. Okay. And they use that during normal operation to provide a proportional amount of fuel. And right. So some people do that. Now what's what's the disadvantage of priming the engine with the throttle as opposed to using the primer? Do you know of anything? Well, the uh, higher likelihood of uh, carb fire. Sure. Exactly. Especially with that updraft carburetor. It's you know. Pours right down. Right down onto the air filter and uh, good possibility of carburetor fire. Sure, so we don't like to do that if we don't have to. Excellent job. I see something down here, it says alternate, it says alt static air pull on. What is that? This is uh, this is our alternate static source, so that in the event that we did have a clogged static port, uh, we would just pop that out and uh, we get alternate static air for uh, our static. Okay, good. I'd like to ask you this. Um, here we have the magneto switch. And I'd like to ask you, um, sometimes, uh, what if you suspected you had what we call a hot magneto? Mm -hmm. How could you check to see if we had a hot magneto? Well, during shutdown, uh, before we pull the mixture back to idle cutoff, uh, we could quickly flip this back to off and then back to both, and it should start to die a little bit when we go to off and then come back to life when we put it back to both. Uh, if it does go off, it indicates that the, uh, the P leads are, in fact, Normal. Normal, okay. If we did have a hot magneto, what dangers are there of a hot magneto? Well, uh, you know, anybody that goes out there and, you know, wants to look in that cowling for bird's nests and they want to turn that prop a little bit, and, you know, it's a potential for, for firing the engine and getting it running. Okay, that sounds good. Alrighty, we've uh, covered uh, just about everything here. What's this right here? That's the most important instrument. That's yeah. the hobbies meter. Hobbs meter, okay, good. Excellent. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, cabin heater, right? We have a cabin heater. It says cabin heat pull on. When you use the cabin heat, what what uh, concerns do you have? Well, uh, concern for carbon monoxide poisoning. And you can see we don't have a carbon monoxide detector anywhere in the panel, so I'd buy a carbon monoxide detector and okay. put it on so the panel. So concern for carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay. Where does the, uh, the cabin heat get its heat from? Uh, it's from a shroud around the exhaust. Um, so okay. if there is a leak in that, uh, we're potentially getting exhaust there into the cabin. Good. Okay. Uh, here we have the carburetor heat. Where does that get its heat from? 
This uh, again gets its gets its heat from a, a shroud around the exhaust. Okay. Now a little earlier, you told me that if we were cruising along at 21, 23, and if we had a, a drop in the RPM, that was an indication of carburetor ice. Okay. Uh, if drop in uh, manifold. Uh, manifold pressure, I'm sorry, a drop in the manifold pressure, that was an indication of carburetor ice. Okay. If ice were present, how could you determine if ice was there by putting on? What would you actually would you take? Well, what I would do in, in my airplane, uh, if I saw that drop in manifold pressure, I'd pull on the carburetor heat knob. Uh, what I would probably see, since we've got higher temperature, less dense air, I'd probably see a, a, a more of a decrease in the manifold pressure. And then as the ice started to clear, it would rise back up again. And then I'd, once I thought it was all gone, mm -hmm. the carburetor heat back in, then it should rise back up sure. to where it was initially. Good. That's a perfect answer. Excellent job. You seem very well prepared on all this. Uh, we have a magnetic compass here. What power is the magnetic compass? Magnetic, uh, magnetic fields of the earth. Yeah, just, just on its own. Okay, excellent. We have a, um, uh, we have some lights here. We go out on a daytime flight. Are there any of those lights that are required to be on whenever we're out flying? Uh, well, right now I don't believe that, that this is required to be on during the daytime. It will be recommended any time the engine's running, and I think that uh, in the future they're actually going to change that rule and make it a Actually, they've changed the rule already. Oh. It is a new rule now. Oops. Okay. <laughs> new rule. Okay, good. Well, anyway, it's a new rule. It, is, it used to be just a good operating practice. It is now mandatory that that be on. Uh, if the airplane is equipped with it. It's a good uh, thing my instructor yeah. told me they have it. Good thing, yeah, he, he teaches you to put it on, so, it's, right. so you didn't need to know that. Okay, good. Excellent. Very good. Okay, you seem well prepared on that. Let's move on to talk about a few other things. Uh, we talked about some uh, aeromedical concerns regarding the um, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about hypoxia. Right? Okay. Uh, what is hypoxia and, and what do we do? Uh, hypoxia is a lack of oxygen to the brain, uh, usually caused, at least in flying, by uh, flight at high altitudes. Um, so their corrective action would be to descent. Okay. Uh, are there or any? Or use supplemental oxygen. Okay, so I'm going to do it. Sure. Uh, what indications, if any, are there that you're becoming hypoxic? Uh, you know, feeling of euphoria. You know, blueness in the fingertips and the lips. Um, you know, in the extremities, you can see the loss of. Of oxygen first, so you can see blue fingertips and lips. What what effect would it have on your on your abilities and so on? Well, it might make you tired, decrease judgment. Uh, you know, you think you're doing better than you're actually sure. doing. Perfect answer. Good. Are there any altitudes uh, above which you have to use supplemental oxygen? Yes, above twelve thousand five hundred feet, uh, use of supplemental oxygen is required by the crew for durations over thirty minutes. Uh, above fourteen thousand feet. Uh, it's continuous use by the crew, uh, and then about 15,000 feet, it must be supplied to the, the passengers. It is provided for them. Okay, good. Now tell me this, is there any altitudes that are good operating practices the FAA has told you about for using supplemental oxygen? Recommended at uh, 10,000 feet during the day and 5,000 feet during the night because it plays such a large role in vision. Okay, so for night, it's the, the vision is the consideration. Right. Okay, good. All right, you seem to know about that uh, very well. Okay, um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, air traffic control light gun signals, mm -hmm. and I just want to ask you, uh, where do they use air traffic control light gun signals? Air traffic control towers. Okay, perfect answer, good. And when would they use those at an air traffic control tower? Uh, when you have uh, an aircraft coming in that has an inoperative radio. Okay, and if you had an inoperative radio and you were coming in uh, at an airport with a tower, what light gun signal would you want to see before you land? Steady green. Steady green. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, let's talk about some airport markings and other lighting. Suppose we were going out to fly and we looked over, we looked at the rotating beacon, and we saw it on today. What would, would that indicate, if anything? Uh, the rotating beacon at the airport. Yes. Uh, that would indicate that the field was IFR during the day. Okay, that's very good. And what is IFR? Less than 1,000 foot ceiling uh, and/or less than three miles visibility. Good. Can you tell me any difference in lighting between runway lights and taxiway lights? Uh, runway lights generally are white or amber, and taxiway lights are uh, blue. Good. All right. I want to just show you some some other uh, other uh, items. I want to talk to you about some traffic pattern indicators. And uh, right here we have a uh, uh, an airport, mm -hmm. and it has some uh, some of these what we call a little markers right around here. And this mm -hmm. is a uh, is a tetrahedron here, mm -hmm. right? I'd like you to tell me if you were coming in to land at this airport, which runway would you land on? And uh, what type of traffic would you make to that runway? 
Well, uh, this indicates that uh, the wind is out of the southwest, so I'd make right traffic uh, to runway 22. Two. Okay, that's perfect. Now tell me this. Notice that runway 22 two has these chevrons. Mm -hmm. Runway 18 has these arrows. Mm -hmm. What do the chevrons and the arrows mean? The arrows mean uh, displaced threshold. This is a uh, stopway or runover. Okay. Uh, so we could use this if we're landing in this direction as an overrun. Okay. Uh, but technically, uh, you know, only if we absolutely okay. had to. All right, well, now let's talk about takeoff for starters, okay? Uh, if you want to take off, is the full length usable at both of these? No. Okay, which one has it usable? This one has okay. it usable. All right, and so, uh, and now, but this one you can't use that for landing, correct? That's correct, okay. or for takeoff. Okay, it's kind of an unusable area, basically, That's right? correct. Okay, yeah. and you can't use it for takeoff. All right, now for takeoff, can you use this? For takeoff, yes, I could use that to take off on runway 1A. Okay, good. That's a perfect answer, good. Okay, now by the way, this is number runway 22. What does that mean, 22? That means that it is oriented 220 degrees. Okay, magnetic or true? Uh, magnetic. magnetic. Perfect answer. Good. All right, so you're very well prepared on this. I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit more about uh, just some things about the airplane. Uh, suppose that you got your private license today and tomorrow you took up a friend and your friend wanted to go over his house, that's the first place they always wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And then he said, what do you want to do now? And he said, I'd like to do whoop de doos right? Mm -hmm. and, and he said, uh, can you do whoop de doos And he said, well, I don't know what a whoop de doo is, but I'll go out and do some stalls with you, right? Yeah. And he went out and did a few stalls. And he said, well, these are all right, but uh, this is, like, I want to see a real whoop de doo right? Mm -hmm. So you, you pulled it way back and kind of a power on stall and broke off into a very hard stall, all right? Mm -hmm. And you did the normal recovery, what you thought, but it didn't seem to work. And all of a sudden, the plane was, Everything was spinning around in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. And you said, you know, I bet I'm in one of these things I've heard about called a spin. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you're not supposed to get out into these and that they can sometimes be hard to recover from, right? Sure. What action have you been taught as to how to recover from this spin? Well, to recover from a spin, I would uh, reduce the throttle to idle, uh, ailerons neutral, uh, full opposite rudder, opposite to the direction of the rotation. Uh, once I've gotten the full opposite rudder, full forward uh, briskly with the, with the control yoke. Uh, once the rotation has stopped, uh, neutralize the rudder and then recover from the uh, resulting bag. Okay. And what about the ailerons? What do you do with those? Ailerons neutral. neutral. Okay, good. That's a perfect answer. Can you tell me anything you've been taught about where stall spin accidents occur so that you can avoid getting into <coughs> those situations? Takeoff uh, and landing. Takeoff specifically, if we have uh, power loss uh, right after takeoff, if we're in a left hand climbing turn, or we try to make a left turn back around to the airport, uh, chances are real good that we're going to end up right at the field boundary. Okay, so on takeoff, power failures, don't come back to the field, might cause spins. Okay, right. perfect, very good answer. I'd like to uh, ask you a little bit on this airplane. Uh, about some of the emergency equipment. When we get out to the plane, I'm going to want you to show it to me. Mm -hmm. But first of all, you showed me earlier that the plane has an ELT. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a couple question about it. First of all, what frequency does that, uh, does that unit transmit on? 121.5. Okay. Emergency. emergency frequency. Good. Now, is that a VHF or, a, uh, or is that a low frequency transmitter? That's a uh, VHF. VHF. Is that line of sight or, uh, or, or is that uh, not line of sight? That would be line of sight. Line of sight, sure. Now, Normally the ELT goes off on the impact force of a crash. Mm -hmm. Is there any way it can be turned on without having to crash? Sure, there's a little black switch on it. Okay, when we get out to the airplane, they'd like you to show me how to operate that, show me the ELT. Would that be all right? Sure. Do we have any, any other kind of emergency equipment on board the airplane? Uh, not at this time, but if I were going in, uh, to an area that would, that would require that, I'd, I'd take out along appropriate equipment. Okay. Oh, do we have any fire extinguishers or anything? Yeah, there is a fire extinguisher. Okay. Well, we get out there, I'd like you to show me how to operate the fire extinguisher. Right? Okay. Um, how about if you were flying a, a trip and it was sub-zero temperatures? Is there anything you want to bring with you on a sub-zero temperature day trip? Uh, some extra blankets, jackets, matches. Good. Okay. I'd like to talk to you about how we operate with pieces of inoperative equipment, right? Mm -hmm. If you know that the number two radio is inoperative and you want to document this properly according to the FAA, mm -hmm. how would you document that? What would you do? Uh, placard it uh, as an operative uh, and then deactivate it. Okay. And how would you deactivate it? Well, uh, in this case, uh, do a couple of things. Probably, you know, come out, have a mechanic pull it out and do a new weight balance. So it costs way too much money. Okay. 
so I'd probably just uh, you know put a little piece of tape here over the on-off switch to make sure no one could no one could turn that on, or if they did, they could realize very quickly that it was it wasn't going to be working. Okay, good. Or maybe if you could, uh, is there any other way you could electrically deactivate? I could it? I could uh, pull the breaker, but yeah. if they have one, yeah, if we have a pullable breaker okay. for it, and cuff it. Okay, good. What if you went out there and you looked uh, at the magnetic compass and you saw the magnetic compass was was uh, all the fluid had leaked out, right? Mm -hmm. How would we handle that? Find a compass. Find a compass. Okay. Can't go. Can't go. Okay. Right. All right. What if you put an inoperative sticker up there? Could you do that? One more. That's why, why not? That's required by 91205. Okay. Sounds good to me. Sounds like you're very well prepared. All right. Um, let's uh, talk about night flying. Right? You've already told me about the how the taxiway lights and so on are marked. And I want to talk to you about uh, whenever you do a uh, a night takeoff or night landing, is there any special precautions you use? Uh, night takeoff, you know, I'm going to pay closer attention, uh, in particular to the altimeter. I'm going to pay a little closer attention to the airspeed, and not necessarily rely on this because of acceleration error. Okay, so the attitude indicator has an error that might be dangerous. That's correct. Okay, good. How about on a night landing? Do you, uh, anything you want to know about night landings for safety? Yeah, pay closer attention to, uh, to altimeter. Watch your I always watch your speed closer, closer attention okay. to the altimeter. Speaking about some night lighting and so on, uh, what color beacon do we have at this airport to help locate it? We have uh, white and green. Okay. If there happened to be a military airport nearby, is there any way you could use the beacon to help tell you which one is the military airport, which is the civil airport? Mm -hmm. We'd have uh, two whites and a green at the military airport, one white and green at the civil. Okay, that's a very good answer. That's exactly correct. Now, uh, let's talk about your cross-country. If we could get the chart out here, we'll take a look at that. Just the chart? Uh, well, let's look at the, uh, the, the flight log and also the, uh, the chart. Okay. okay. So you planned this trip out here. Uh -huh. I'll set this out of the way. Now, uh, what altitude did you select for this trip? Uh, I flight plan for uh, for four thousand five hundred. Okay, and um, okay, and then uh, we well, talk about maybe going to eighty five later or so. But anyway, right. forty five hundred on this flight plan. All right. Right. Excellent. Now, uh, how did you select four thousand five hundred feet? Uh, I selected four thousand five hundred feet based on the uh, based on the direction of flight. You know, okay. Since I'm westbound, uh, so it would be an even thousand plus five hundred. Okay. All right. How about traveling at three thousand feet? Could we do that? Sure. Could we fly at 3,500 feet? Uh, yeah. Okay. But now, why is that? Uh, uh, that's an odd thousand plus 500, isn't it? Yes, it is. That's because we're within 3,000 feet of the surface. Okay, so, kind of spherical, so the ground here is, is uh, about 700 feet or so. Mm -hmm. So plus 3 is 37. So 35 is okay because it's less than that. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay, good. Exactly right. I thought that's what you're saying. It sounds good. Exactly right. Good. Okay. How about flying at 4,000? Could we fly at 4,000? Okay. If we did fly at 4,000, would we be breaking any rules, or is that just a bad operating practice? We'd actually be breaking a rule. Okay, so this is a rule. We must fly at mm -hmm. these even thousands plus 500. Okay, yep. excellent. Now, I'd like to uh, ask you here uh, exactly, uh, I have an example here I want to show you mm -hmm. that I have for out, and I'm just going to bring this in here. This happens to be out around uh, uh, Cedar, uh, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. and you notice the variation here is about 10 degrees, mm -hmm. right? Right, 10 degrees of variation, and you can see an airway that runs down here, mm -hmm. right, uh, from this VOR, and the airway says on it 176 degrees. Mm -hmm. However, you can see that based on true south, where the line of longitude is, mm -hmm. that this line is actually to the west mm -hmm. of true south, mm -hmm. right? Now, I want you to pretend that you're going down this airway, south on this airway, and you have a wind from the right causing you 10 degrees of wind correction angle, okay. right? So what I want to ask you is, what altitude would be appropriate for your direction of flight if you were operating more than 3,000 feet above the ground? Well, what I'm interested in is, uh, is my magnetic course. I know that uh, this airway is referencing the VOR, which are oriented with magnetic. Uh, so this would be my magnetic course of 176 degrees. That's between 0 and 179. So this would be an odd thousand plus 500. So, okay. you know, around here, probably uh, 7,500 feet. Okay, sure. 
Okay, or, 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 or higher, but not 9,500. Right. Okay, good. What about this fact that the wind causes you to correct 10 degrees to the right? Would that have any, would that change anything? No. Okay. Well, now that would, if you ten, 10 degrees more to the right, wouldn't your magnetic heading be about 186? That'd be my ma magnetic heading, but I'm basing my altitude selection on magnetic course only. Okay, magnetic course. That's correct. Okay. So, but now it does appear that this is a little bit to the west of true south. Doesn't that make any difference? It is a little to the west of true south. But we're not basing it off of true, we're basing it off of magnetic okay. direction. Okay, good. Perfect. These are perfect answers you're giving me. Excellent. Very good job. You're very, well, very well prepared. Now, on this flight that we're going to fly from Powaukee out to Cedar Rapids, mm -hmm. can you tell me if we would, uh, would we have to have a transponder on this flight? Yes, we would. Okay, can you tell me some reasons why? Well, uh, we'd be within 30 nautical miles of uh, the Class B airspace at Chicago O'Hare. Okay. And that's reason number one. Um, and reason number two would be that Cedar Rapids is Class C airspace, uh, and mode C is also required in and above Class C. Okay, perfect. In and above. That's exactly correct. All right. Now, by the way, is there any altitude above which, if we were in route, we would have to have an altitude reporting transponder? Above 10,000 feet, we need a mode C transponder. Okay, yeah. It's at, at or above. At or above. Close enough. Perfect. Okay, good. All right, excellent job. Okay, now uh, I'd like to ask you, if we were flying this trip, say we took off here and we're flying along, and you notice here's, here's Rockford, mm -hmm. and suppose we were flying at 4,500 feet, like you suggested, mm -hmm. and suppose that there was some weather up ahead, and we decided to deviate around that weather, mm -hmm. and we're flying to the right, and as you're flying to the right, you look down and you see that you're directly over the Rockford Airport. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you continue on, but then you turn back and you continue on, right? Mm -hmm. And you never called anyone, all right? But you're at 4,500 feet. Would you be in any violation of rules for doing that? No. No. Why not? It, it appears that this goes up to 8,000 feet. This is uh, voluntary participation in the terminal radar service area. Okay. It's not mandatory. Okay. If this were a Class C airport, then yes, I'd be in violation, but it's not. Okay. This is exactly correct. All right. Well, now, and, and in addition yeah. to that, the uh, the surface of the Class D airspace here only goes up to 3,000, not the surface, the top of the Class D airspace only goes up to 3,200 feet, and at 4,500, I'd be above that. Okay, good. Would it be a good operating practice to call them as you fly through there? Yes. Be a good idea. Okay, and they would provide you with what kind of service? They provide me with uh, with sequencing and. Uh, separation. Basically time. radar service. Okay, right, right. good. Sure. Okay, exactly correct. Okay, that's a perfect answer. Now, I'd like to ask you though, suppose we get back on course and we go down over the Polo, uh, we're flying near the Polo VOR on this trip, mm -hmm. and uh, as we're flying along, uh, you decide that you want to call for some, uh, you want to call flight service station for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. What frequency could you use to call the uh, uh, flight service station? Who would you call and what frequency would you use? Okay. Well, using the Polo VOR, we could use the uh, the RCO here. Uh, talking to Kankakee Radio, as noted by underneath the, the VOR frequency box, uh, I would put 111.2 in my nav radio uh, and listen to that, monitor it, uh, and then I would uh, put 122.1 in my communications radio because they receive only on 122.1. I would listen over the VOR. That's very good. Excellent answer. Suppose you wanted to, instead of calling flight service, you wanted to call flight watch. Mm -hmm. What frequency would you use for that? 122.0. Okay. Now, <coughs> what kind of service does flight watch provide? Uh, in route and destination weather. Okay. And, uh, acceptance of pilot reports. Okay. Now, can flight watch provide you with radar flight following service? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's exactly correct. The perfect answer, right? A lot of people think because it's flight watch that they're going to watch them somehow. No. Not true. Okay. Excellent. Well prepared. Suppose that on your cross country you were right here, right? Right in this position that you can see. Mm -hmm. Right there. I'll use the pointers to show you exactly where that is. Okay. You're right there and you're at 4,500 feet. Mm -hmm. What are your VFR minimums there? At 4,500 feet we'd be in the Class E airspace, so we need a minimum of 3 miles visibility, 500 feet below the clouds, 1,000 above and 2,000 horizontal separation. Okay. Good. Now suppose that up ahead it looked like it was going to be questionable as to whether you could maintain three miles visibility because of some light rain you see falling. Okay. Mm -hmm. How could you continue on with maybe less than three miles visibility? Well, uh, I could I could descend to uh, to Clancy G airspace, which right here would uh, would 
begin at uh, 1,200 feet AGL. Okay, so go below that. What would you have to have to be down there? Just Less a than mile, 1,200. A mile of visibility and remain clear of the clouds. Okay, good. Now, as you continue on and you get in this area near this airport, is there anything else you'd have to do in order to continue? Well, once I hit this magenta vignette, I'd have to uh, duck down to below uh, 700 feet AGL. Okay, all right. Well, what if you got down there and it looked really bad, right? It was looking lightning up ahead and you decided you were going to divert and you were going to land at this airport right here, the Tri-County Airport. Mm -hmm. You landed there and, and it was raining very hard mm -hmm. and, and you tied the plane, you, you, you stayed in the plane as a matter of fact, it was raining so hard. Mm -hmm. but then when it stopped raining, you tied the plane down and you went inside to check on getting a rental car. Mm -hmm. And just as you went inside, you saw somewhere in there that had a coat and tie on and a clipboard. Yeah. He said, I'm from the FAA, I'm here to help you, yeah. right? And then he said, did you just land here VFR? And you said, yes, sir. And he said, how much, what does the visibility and, and everything have to be, the what meteorological conditions, what do they have to be in order to land here VFR? What would you tell him? I'd say one mile uh, and clear of clouds. Okay, that's exactly correct, mile and clear of clouds. Okay, now, okay, so uh, you go over to the rent-a-car place and, and they don't have any rent-a-cars. They say the closest place to get a rent-a-car is over here at Clinton, right? Mm -hmm. And suppose you check the weather and they've said that Clinton currently has 1,500 overcast, visibility two miles in rain. Mm -hmm. Would that present any problems to go over there to Clinton? Yeah. Okay, what kind of problems would it present? Uh, I would need a special VFR in order to get to the surface base class E. Okay, who would you call to get uh, that if you were to fly over there? Well, I could do it a number of ways. If I wanted it before I left the ground, I could uh, call flight service. That, that creates hassles for them. Okay. Uh, so. Actually, that's probably the best way to do it, because if I took off and I had to stay beneath this and then stay below 1,200 here, I probably would not be able to receive uh, Quad City approach. They're probably the ones who have to, have to issue it, okay. but they probably wouldn't be able to hear me and okay. I wouldn't be able to hear them. Okay. So. All right. Well, let's say you took off, and when you took off, it was actually pretty good around here, right? Mm -hmm. Ceiling was up around four or 5,000 feet here, mm -hmm. and the visibility was probably about five miles here. Okay. When you took off, you listened to the AWAS and it was giving it was giving two miles visibility, mm -hmm. right? Now, how would you get a special VFR to land there? Call up uh, Quad City Approach and uh, quickly I'd look here. And, uh, well, they don't uh, they don't give a frequency. Normally, they would give a okay. call. Uh, there's an the ATIS frequency, but they do not give an approach frequency here. All right. So I'd listen up to the ATIS and that would probably tell me what sure. to use. Sure. Perfect answer. All right. So suppose they said to you, you're cleared into the Clinton area, surface area Class E airspace at or below 5,000 feet, and they said maintain special BFR conditions while within the Class E airspace, mm -hmm. um, surface area Class E airspace. What does that mean when they say maintain special BFR? Well, maintain uh, one mile visibility, clear the clouds. Okay, where would that be? Would that be while you're over here or just while you're within that area? Only once I've crossed the magenta dashed line. Okay, sure, that's exactly right. Good. Are there any restrictions on special BFRs having to do with the time of day that you have heard about? Yes. Uh, at night, the pilot must be uh, instrument rated and the aircraft instrument equipped. Okay, good answer. All right. Well, you get over to Clinton and uh, and, and you tie the plane down. You got your special BFR in there and you're in the rental car line. However, just when I get to you, they say, sorry, last one, last one just went here. We don't have any more cars, all right? So you decide that you're going to have to wait out the weather, right? So you wait for about four hours, and sure enough, the weather does clear up, right? However, they still have two and a half miles visibility here. It's much better as you get to the west, right? Mm -hmm. Would we need a special BFR to take off from this airport? Mm -hmm. we yes, we would. Okay. All right, it's, it's not quite dark yet, so, so you are able to get a special BFR. It's still daytime, and you take off with a special BFR. Okay. You depart the area, and you're now going, you're now going over to, uh, to Clint, right? Or correction, over to uh, Cedar Rapids, right? Um, However, uh, by the time you get there, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, is, it, is, it is night, all right, and the tower has closed. They close at, uh, I don't know exactly what time they close, but let's say they close at uh, whatever. You're getting there after the time they close. Uh, my question to you is, what frequency would you use in order to possibly enhance safety to be aware of other traffic in the area? What frequency would you monitor and what frequency would you use to do to, uh, uh, to it? safety there. I would uh, broadcast my intentions on 118.7, which is the CTAP, denoted by the, the inverted C there, okay. um, and listen up for other traffic that may be in the area, okay. also broadcasting on 118.7. Okay. 
Okay. 2.7. Okay, that's a good answer. All right, good. Uh, how long is the runway there at that airport? Length of the, the longest runway is 8,600 feet. Okay, good. Now, what's that frequency there? 122.95. What is that? That's a unicom frequency. Okay, good. Okay, I'll move this over to see a little better. I'd call them okay. and see if they had another rental car. Okay, you can call them. They could arrange for things like that. Good. Okay, next day you come out and you're going to depart from this airport and the tower is operating. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what procedure would you follow to depart from this airport? The tower is operating? The tower is operating. Uh, first, I'd listen up to the ATIS, mm -hmm. uh, find out what the weather is. Uh, after I've obtained the ATIS, I'd contact ground, an appropriate okay. ground control frequency, which we could find either on the mm -hmm. top sure. of the okay. charter and the AFD. Um, tell them uh, what my intentions are. Uh, they did assign me a, a radar code, a squawk code, um, and tell me to taxi to whatever runway. Okay. And I'd contact Tower. Uh, once I got out of Tower's area or they were tired of me, they'd hand me off to, uh, to departure. Okay. Sure. That's good. Exactly right. Would you expect that they would assign an altitude at this airport when you depart there? They may give me a restriction to my altitude okay. in some okay. cases. All right. All right. Exactly. Now, uh, suppose that you took off and you wanted to go, um, you wanted to go uh, visit a friend, all right? And this friend was uh, over here at, uh, we'll find some airport here, um, right down here at uh, Mount Pleasant Airport, mm -hmm. uh, right by Pleasant, uh, this town of Pleasant. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're going in there and I noticed that they have a frequency there of 122.9, right? And you might notice that, that other airports have 122.7. Uh, some of them have 122 point, or there's 123 mm -hmm. uh, My question to you is, what does what is 122.9? 122.9 is uh, is multicom. Mm -hmm. uh, basically means that uh, it will be unmonitored. There's no one on the ground there listening to it. So if you call up and say like when's it active, mm -hmm. uh, no one's going to tell you. Maybe another another airplane yeah, might tell you, but no base station. Okay, right. good. How about at these other airports like Burlington here with 123.0? Uh, if you're lucky and there's someone here listening, uh, they'll, they'll chime in and let you know what the, the winds and active runway are and uh, potential traffic in the pattern. Good, okay. Down here, suppose that you wanted to go to Macomb. Notice Macomb is located within this, this area here, uh, this magenta shaded area, special type of different shading. What does that indicate to you? This is uh, special use airspace. Uh, specifically, this is a military operations area. And this is called Howard East MOA. Uh, so I could find out the altitudes and the times of use for this Howard East MOA by looking at the top, uh, you know, on the other side of the chart here. Okay. A, suppose that the area was in use above 5,000 feet, mm -hmm. right? And suppose you want to fly through there, even at that, above 5,000 feet, mm -hmm. and you went and did that, even though you knew the area was in use. Mm -hmm. what, what, what problems might you have, if any? I run into somebody. I run into somebody. Okay. Would you get an FAA violation for that? No. No violation If I run into somebody. If you ran into violation, <laughs> if you ran into somebody, that'd be bad, okay. Good. Okay, sounds pretty good. Now I'd like to just take a minute to look at the other side of the map here. Okay. And we have, have an area that's uh, another kind of airspace I want to ask you about. Here it is right here. Refer to this right here. Right here. You notice there's an area here that seems to be marked in big letters. It says restricted, R, R6903. What does that indicate to you, if anything? Well, restricted area, uh, again, it means that there's some type of uh, military activity going on within this blue outlined area. Mm -hmm. I could find out the altitudes of use the same way I looked up here on uh, 69 Suppose it was in use and you flew through it anyway. What problems might you have? No, that would be a violation. Violation. Okay. And is there anything else that might happen to you? It might run into somebody. Might run into something. somebody. Okay. Might you be shot down? Could be. Okay. Would they shoot you down on purpose? Maybe. No. <laughs> no, probably not. Probably not, no. It would always be an accident. They, they never say, I'm going to shoot down that 172. I'm tired of him coming through here. Okay. All right, yeah, it would be, a, it would be an accident. They'd probably say they're sorry about it. But, sure. but uh, okay. Uh, very good. You seem very well prepared. I'm going to just review over here and see if there's anything I wanted to ask you about. I haven't. Um, if you were lost, all right, uh, what what could you do to help, help locate yourself? You, you, you've already tried using the VORs and you've determined they're not working, that's why you're lost, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what, what assistance might the FAA be able to provide you? Uh, well, I could uh, call up a radar facility uh, okay. and they would they would tell me to squawk a particular code, maybe IDENT or okay. something like Good. that, and yeah. 
Perfect, good. Suppose that you didn't have a transponder. Is there any other service that might be available at some locations? Uh, yeah, at some flight service stations, they still have uh, DF steer equipment, in which case they tell me, you know, transmit or open the mic, and I'd open up the mic, and then their, their receiver would point right at my sure. bearing. So, so what equipment would you have to have to get DF assistance? Com radio. Com radio, okay. Sure, perfect answer, good. Okay, um, I'd like to ask you, if, if you went out to the airplane, and it was winter, and you found that there was some frost and snow on the airplane, okay? Mm -hmm. Could we take off with either frost or snow, or what's what's the rule associated with that? How much could we have on the plane and still take off? Well, my rule would be none. Okay. Uh, I would a good rule. I would say none. Um, uh, technically, there's there's no reg uh, to, saying that we don't we don't have to have any on the airplane, but uh, I think it would be good operating practice. Okay, sure. No, none. Right. Uh, right. Exactly. Good. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about wake turbulence. Suppose that you were um, going to be landing behind a large airplane. Mm -hmm. The large airplane has departed. A big four engine airplane. Mm -hmm. Big put up those engines, put up all this thrust, and runs down the runway about halfway and takes off. Mm -hmm. You're landing behind him at Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you avoid that that turbulence from that airplane whenever you're landing there? Well, I'd uh, land prior to his point of rotation. Okay, so you try to maybe put it in new numbers, for example. Mm -hmm. That'd be right. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Right. Good. Okay, that sounds uh, sounds pretty good. Um, I think we covered things pretty well. Uh, one other radio aid I want to ask you about is, we, we talked about the, uh, uh, can you show me a, uh, a VOR station and, and maybe a, a kind of a, and, and other, show me the kind of radio aids we have on this band. Okay. Well, uh, looking over here at Oshkosh and Fond du Lac, we've got uh, around Fond du Lac Airport, you can see an NDB with the uh, little stippling okay. around the airport. And what there. kind of radio would you use to tune that in? This you would use an ADF. Okay. All right, can you show me any other kind of radio aids? Sure, here we would have uh, a Vortac at, uh, at Oshkosh. And again, this is the line of sight deal. Okay. Uh, and this would actually give you a specific radio that you were on from. Good, okay. Now I know your airplane is equipped with DME. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, kind of radio aids do you use to, to get DME? Uh, DME, you'd use uh, Vortacs or uh, VOR DMEs. Okay, all right. How about ADF? Could you use it on an ADF? Uh, no. No, couldn't use that idea. Okay. Good. Seems like you're uh, well prepared. Now, I see these lines going across here. What are these lines? These lines represent uh, Victor Airways, which begin at uh, 1,200 feet. Uh, uh, AGL. Okay. Uh, it's are, are we allowed to fly on Victor Airways? Sure. Sure. Okay. Good. Exactly right. Okay, just see if there's anything else I want to talk to you about. Basically, I can see everything looks good. Let me brief you a little bit about what we're going to do when we get in the airplane. Okay. And then, because basically I uh, finished all the ground testing here. What we're going to do is we're going to depart on this cross country. It's a VFR cross country. You're going to stay on this course. Uh, I want you to um, basically, uh, I'll review your flight plan here in just a minute. Uh, and I want to, uh, uh, you tell me, uh, simulate activating that flight plan when we get in the air. Okay. I'd like to also, I would like to uh, tell you that we're going to go out and when you seem to be on course doing well, then I'm going to ask you to basically uh, begin some maneuvers starting with slow flight. Okay. And of course, I'll expect you to do clearing turns uh, prior to maneuvers when necessary and we'll do some slow flight. Uh, after we're in the slow flight, I made a few turns, I'm going to ask you to bring the power back and we will do some stalls with the flaps down uh, and we'll basically be doing approach to landing type stalls. Uh, and we'll end up concluding these with a go-around, using normal go-around procedure. Uh, then we'll make sure the area is clear and we'll do some power-on takeoffs type stalls. We'll be doing these with about 15 degrees of bank. Okay. Uh, I basically have a, uh, an order of things that I've developed, something called a plan of action, that allows me to check off things that I have to, have to test on this mandatory test. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have a, a checklist of items that I've been going through now and checking off somewhat. And when we're all finished, I'll ask you to sign this showing that you've completed the FAA test. Okay. But after our slow flight and stalls, then we'll do some steep turns, uh, at 45 degree bank steep turns. I'll have you put the hood on. We'll do a little instrument flight, uh, climbs, turns, descents, navigate to a VOR, recover from an unusual attitude under instruments. And I'll probably have you do an emergency landing over some airport that I'll uh, find out an emergency spot for you to do an emergency landing. Okay. Uh, then we'll probably do some ground reference maneuvers like turns around point. Then uh, you'll probably be lost by that time, so we'll use lost procedures and diversion, and I'll have you divert to another airport 
and you're allowed to be allowed to use radio navigation. In fact, encouraged to do that. We'll get into that airport. I'll watch your traffic pattern. We'll do some soft and short field landings. We'll probably be diverting to, to a little uh, uncontrolled airport that I know out, out here. Uh, and then we'll uh, basically uh, be returning uh, back to uh, back to Powaukee Airport here. That's the basic plan. Uh, I would like to uh, look at your uh, flight plan here just to see how you can remember you had altitude 4,500. Uh, you said wind direction was this, that's your true airspeed, you can have that out of the book. You see your true course is the same, you've done a wind correction angle, corrected for the variation, all right, and the deviation was zero. Where do you get deviation, by the way? Deviation I get uh, off of that card on the compass, compass correction card. Right. Perfect, okay. You figured your ground speed. Good. Now, when you get to your first one or two checkpoints here, I want you to be able to tell me, say, say I'm ahead or behind on my flight plan. Because after all, you're planning this to the maximum range of the plane. So it's important to be able to determine that if you're falling behind on your flight plan, that, that might mean you'll have to make an early stop, for instance, for fuel. So it's going to be important that you demonstrate to me that you know how to see whether you're ahead or behind on a flight plan. Okay. You've done a nice job here. You figure the fuel, and you put down a lot of frequencies you're going to use. Excellent. You've done a very good job. This is an excellent uh, oral test uh, so far. Uh, uh, and we're uh, going to go out and do the flying now, see how you do with that. And Basically, as I say, it's a practical test. Just perform exactly as you would as if you were taking passengers on this trip. So, very good. <clears throat>